Well, we live in a digital age. The technology that surrounds us enables us to experience opportunities and advantages in our daily lives that those in previous decades have had no clue. I mean, the, the, the smartphones, for example, uh, they give us the option to explore our finances, to keep up with our fitness, to uh, listen to music, to play games, to watch movies, to find out what the weather's going to be, and even have uh, GPS, and on and on and on and on we could go. Television, of course, introduces us to an entire different world within the convenience of our own home, sometimes uh, more times than not, not something we want to watch, but nonetheless, television does provide us with some advantages. And of course, computers provide us with the, the ability to create, to design, to write, any number of things. But take a moment and imagine for just a moment, if you didn't have those things, uh, what, or if you didn't activate those things, <laughs> I know some of you are smiling because you know uh, you're still in the last century. I know, understand that. Uh, but but those, while those things still contain within themselves everything that is necessary, and, and in fact more than it's necessary, to give us certain advantages, what if they were never activated, never used, as some of you perhaps have not ex- discovered? The countless hours, millions of dollars in sheer genius that had been poured out in creating and producing these technological devices would not be leveraged to their full potential. In other words, they would be wasted. I think a lot of times with my smartphone, I'm still trying to learn how to use a smartphone, and I think a lot of times I'm, I'm, not, I'm only using the, just the tip of the iceberg. Well, I want to say that there is something that is far more powerful than the technology that we have around us. There's something that is far more, that has more potential for a positive influence in every area of our life, more than any of the technology that we carry with us each day. You know what that is? It's the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, You you see, 2,000 years ago, when Christ died on the cross, he provided resources for us that are beyond what we often as believers even come to realize. In fact, I'm of the opinion, just of the, and I don't want to sound overly negative here, but I'm of the opinion that many believers do not understand the full impact of the cross. Yes, I understand. Many of us understand that that means the, the impact of the cross certainly begins with our salvation. I get that. Most of us do, I, I would hope. But here's the problem. For most Christians, young and older, we often confine our thoughts of the cross to that which leads to salvation, especially on Palm Sunday. And to some degree, we, we, we connect it to our trials and our burdens and our tri- tribulations, you might say. And we say, of course, you know, you've got to carry your cross. You've got to bear your cross, right? But, the, but here's the problem. Far too many Christians regard the cross as a historical, historical event that will take them to heaven one day rather than the present reality that when it is activated in our lives, it will bring heaven to earth daily. In other words, it has implications for a successful, triumphant Christian life daily. Uh, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, and we're going to get there, he said, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. How's that conquering going? Let me give you my paraphrase. This is just my paraphrase. 
we believers overwhelmingly triumph daily through Christ's victory on the cross. Do you connect the two? Do you connect those two every day? Let me ask you, how many days this week did you win? You say, what are you talking about? I've thought of it often uh, uh, this week. I I thought, you know, I I hear coaches, college coaches, football coaches, basketball coaches, whatever. They say to their players, go win the day. Now, what they're talking about is not a game on Saturday or whenever. What they're talking about is go to class. Do what you're supposed to do. Be successful in what you're, do, you're called to do. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. Do we win the day? If we are made overwhelmingly conquerors, do we win the day? You say, what do you, what do you mean by that? When you go through each day and go through the week, and they may be tough days. I'm not talking about bumping heaven every day. I'm not talking about, oh, everything's wonderful. Everything's not wonderful every day. And as a believer, you face tribulations and trials. But when you go through every day, do you experience Christ's presence there? Do you sense as you pray for God to lead you? Do you see things that happen? Maybe just obscure things, small things, but you say, whoa, that's a God thing. When you go through those, face those situations that perhaps are going to shape your life or may have some consequences, and you don't get the results that you want, is your reaction, is, or, or your or your re- Actions, reaction or actions, are they pleasing to the Lord? Do you walk away from that and say, well, it didn't go the way I wanted it to go, but the Lord is, is pleased with my response, I'm, I'm sure. That's winning the day. That's conquering the day. You see, you follow me? Many people would say, sign me up for that one. Well, listen, Christ's death provides every believer not just salvation, mind you, and that's important, that's vital. We understand that. We are blessed. We are so blessed by his grace to have salvation. But it doesn't end there. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, a, of a fear that so many believers today are not being taught the deeper truths of God's word that can uh, uh, compel them to live a life that is Radically different. Well, there's no chapter in the New Testament that better teaches this than Romans 6. Normally, just a footnote here, normally when I, during, uh, every year when we come to Palm Sunday and Easter, I usually step out of the series, whatever the series is that I'm going through, and I give a message that's more appropriate for Palm Sunday and one for Easter. And I'll do that next week with Easter. But as I was contemplating what should I preach on Palm Sunday, I thought, look back at my, the passage in Romans 6, and I thought, there's no better passage that speaks of Christ's death, and especially as it speaks to our lives daily. And, and, and most importantly, communicates the victory that is ours. The message of the of the title of the message is Christ uh, Jesus death my triumph your triumph and so today we want to ask the question are we winning today are we winning each day how's the battle going because it is a spiritual battle and the adversary is, is after the believer he wants to sift us but how's the battle going well let's turn to our text in Romans chapter 6 Romans chapter 6 and it, it's so important that we understand at least what we've gone over. And we, if you weren't here last Sunday, then you missed the big part of this. But, and I highly encourage you to go back and listen to this uh, last Sunday's message because it really connects to this section today. But what I want to do at least 
is to read through verses 1 through 4. So let's, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And remember, Paul is anticipating the argument from those who would say, if you preach grace so much, Paul, you preach grace so much, so are you saying that we should continue to sin so that God will be glorified as he, the more he, grace he pours out, the more he's glorified? And there were those who argued that. There are those today who would say that. He says, may it never be. Meganoito in the Greek. Untranslatable phrase. It is... It, is the, is it, it would be as if I were to stand on top of this pulpit and yell to the top of my lungs, no, no way, no way, absolutely no way. This can happen. Huh. How shall we who die to sin, and let me just say here, that in this passage, and it, beca- it will become more evident as we read through this, but let me just say here, when you see sin in the singular, in the Greek text, it is the sin. It has a definite article, the, in front of it. So it's speaking not of the acts of sin, but of the nature of sin from which the acts will come. You follow me? And we'll see that. It'll be more, it will be more clearly in just a moment. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, you read the word baptize, and you'll have, no, you'll have no understanding of that. That will not make any sense to you unless you understand that the word baptizo, which is our word baptist, uh, baptize is a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo, which was used in a figurative sense and in a literal sense. In a figurative sense, it was used to speak of identification, something that would be dropped into a, a bowl of dye or something or uh, whatever you pulled out of some bowl that had been immersed, would have a new identity. And so the only way you can understand this passage and what he's saying here is to understand that he's saying those who have been identified with Christ, uh, who have been identified into Christ, that is, we've been joined to Christ, have also been identified into his death. Now, verse 4 Therefore, we have been bab- buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So the Apostle Paul points out that we have been baptized, we've been identified with Christ in his death. So he's saying, remember, when you trusted Christ, you came into a union with Christ. You became identified with him. No longer identified with whom? Say it. Adam. Adam. Right? Now, now we're identified with Christ. Paul uses the phrase more than once. The first Adam, the second Adam. First Adam brought us sin and death. The second Adam brings us life. Right? You follow me? Now, he says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through in, into death, so that, and when you see the word so that, it is introducing a purpose clause. It's saying for this purpose. So you study your Bible, when you see so that, usually it's the Greek word ena, which means for this purpose, in order that, or could be translated. Um, in order that, uh, as... Uh, Let's go back. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of his, the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now, again, what does verse 4 say? What happens? Why are we associated? And what is the product, the provision that Christ made for us on the cross? So that we, we, we is in reference to whom? believers, right? So that we might walk in what? Say it out loud. Newness of life, right? So now a few things we want to note about verse 4 because verse 4 leads into verse 5 and and for us to understand our text today we have to understand this verse. Might walk is in what we call a Greek present tense which has the idea of continuing to walk. That's a picture of the Christian life, is it not? Christian life, the reason that the authors of the New Testament use the word 
walk is because it's a picture of putting one step in front of the other. The Christian life is a moment by moment, day by day, walk with the Lord. It's not a once a week, twice a week, uh, coming to meetings. It's about a walk with the Lord. And so what he's saying here, this newness of life, this walk, is something that should be constant. Now, the word newness is the same word in Corinthians, which states that we are a new creation. Paul wrote Corinthians, as he wrote, did here, he wrote Romans. And so, more than likely, it's the same idea, the same concept. So, the newness he's talking about here is a new kind of life. He's talking about a transformation that's taken place. So, here's the question. How did Christ's death provide every believer a means of triumph in the Christian life? Well, here's the answer to that. Christ's death brought a transformation of the heart. Christ's death brought a transformation of the heart. One other thing that I want to call to your attention here about the original text, the Greek text, is that here when it talks about walk, it says you might walk in newness of life. It's a mood, this might walk is a mood of potential. It's a subjunctive mood which means we have the potential to walk in newness of life. Now, follow me here. When we come to Christ, we receive his spirit. His spirit is resident in each of us. Now, we can take his spirit and we can relegate it to one room of the house of our heart and never allow the spirit, never activate the spirit to begin to work in our lives and go through room after room after room and to renovate those rooms. You see? When we receive Christ, we are pre-qualified. I used that idea last week, the concept of being pre-qualified. By receiving Christ, we have promise of eternal life. But we also are pre-qualified to walk here in a newness of life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have a good life, is that what he said? I've come that you might have a fairly decent life. No, did he? He said, I've come that you might have, what? Abundant life. Hmm. Hmm. So, Christ's death brought transformation. It's interesting, in Romans 12, 2, it says, be transformed First in verse 1, of course, you know it says, yield your life to Christ. And in verse 2 it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The idea of transform there being trans- is a continuous idea, a habitual idea, that we are to continuously, day by day, moment by moment, allow the Spirit of God, say, Spirit, come out of this room. I want you to take, begin to go through my, the rooms of my life and make assessments in each of those areas of my life. And I want you to tell me, and, and do your work there. Renovate those rooms. That's what he's talking about when he talks about a new kind of life. Now, verse 5, Paul's driving this home. Paul's driving this thing home that we are, we are united with Christ, we are identified with Christ, and therefore there's a new kind of life available to us. And he wants us to live that kind of life. So in verse 5, he uses a different metaphor, a different illustration. Let's read it. It says, for if we have become, and by the way, if in the, in the English there's one word for if, and we use it different ways, but in the Greek there are four different words for if. In this particular case, it's if and it's true. You could write over that word if, since. For since we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now this... <laughs> This verse is so good. It is so good. <laughs> uh, what's the illustration? The illustration that Paul gives us here is an illustration of graf- graphic, that of grafting something into another. Let me illustrate it this way. You've, many of you have heard it many times, and just be gracious, okay? Uh, but when we were in seminary, Deb and I lived in this two bedroom house no bigger no bigger than this stage but it had in the yard an avocado tree and an orange tree 
but it's not the, it was not the regular run-of-the-mill orange tree because it had grafted into it limes and lemons. And at different times of the year, each one of those would blossom. In fact, the people, we, we rented from some people in our church, I was, uh, and, and, and they said they've never seen that tree blossom like it did. Now, why was the, how did that orange tree have limes and lemons? Well, the grandfather of one of these people that we rented from, his name was Nicholas. He was an old Greek, and that's what he did. And so he grafted limes and lemons into this tree, and they blossomed. That's the idea that Paul is using here. Those limes and lemons were not naturally born of that tree. They had to be grafted in. We are not naturally born of of God. Why? Because the Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses and sin. We're unrighteous. God's tree is a righteous tree, right? Right? But we were, what Paul is saying here in this context, this is why it's so good, we have been grafted in to his tree of life. And now we are one and the same. You following what he's saying? It's tremendous stuff. Huh. John 15, what did Jesus say? That very familiar passage, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he goes on to say, to say apart from you, you can, you can do what? Some things? Nothing. Paul said, just as a branch is tied to its trunk and shares its life, so we are tied to Christ, and therefore we share his life. We're no longer tied to Adam. Adam was a a dead tree. And here God takes limbs from a dead tree, and he grafts them into a tree that's alive, and those dead limbs come back to life. You following the metaphor? So look at the verses that, that speak to this. Look at verse 8. It says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You could translate that preposition with him, in him. There's some flexibility in the Greek text. In verse 10 it says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So if he lives the life, to, if Christ in his resurrected life, lives now, we too, what? We're grafted to him. We live as well. Hmm. Verse 10, or verse 11. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. We're going to come back to this verse in a few moments. But consider yourself to be what? Dead to that, here it is, follow me. Dead to that sin nature. Not just sinning, but dead to that sin nature. Think of it this way. I was telling somebody this week, uh, um, they, they were, I forgot who it was, but they said, I, we, I don't drink coffee. And I said, well, you know what? I didn't start drinking coffee until about 10, 11, 12 years ago. And what got me on coffee was Debbie let me drink some of her hazelnut iced coffee from McDonald's. That's not a commercial for them, by the way. Uh, and I love that hazelnut stuff. And so I fell in love with hazelnut iced coffee. Well, that, of course, after that, I began to drink hot coffee with hazelnut. And so every morning before I come to the office, I stop by racetrack and I get hazelnut coffee with hazelnut cream, right? When I put that, now that coffee is black and the cream is white, right? But when I put it together, there's a, inextricable union that takes place, right? Now it becomes brown. Now, I can't separate that cream from the coffee. If anyone tries to separate the cream from the coffee, there's chaos in the cup, right? You can't do that. I want you to understand, we are just as inextricably identified amalgamated 
in Christ is that cream with that coffee. We cannot be separated. That's why people say, well, you, 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 know, you can lose your salvation. Look, I don't have anything to do with my salvation. All I can do is receive it, and if I don't have anything to do with it, I certainly can't separate myself from that union. Hmm. Hmm. Now, the flow of the text is so vital for us to know um, in order to understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here. And again, this passage, if you can get a hold of this passage and you really believe it, it will be life-changing. But, it, but I guess the next question one would ask, though, as he walks through this is, okay, I get that I'm joined with Christ, I'm identified with him, I'm inextricably uh, identified with him, but, but how do, where does that begin? How do I begin to uh, activate the realities that we're talking about, this transformed life? Well, look in verse uh, in verse 6, he says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Let's just stop right that, right there. The word knowing this. So where does it start? It starts with knowing. Again, that's a Greek present participle. And what you need to understand is that a Greek present participle always happens, uh, is always simultaneous with the main verb. So you look back at the passage, you say, what's the main verb? Well, you have to go back to uh, verse uh, 4 or 5. It talks about we have become united with him. Okay? And so the idea that is knowing, our knowing begins by understanding that we have been put together with Christ. And we have died, in this text it says we have died to the old sin nature. So in order for me to win the day or the circumstance, I must begin by a knowledge. I must begin by first understanding I am in Christ. There's nothing that can separate me from that. The first thing that Paul tells them is that they must know this reality and the reality of the reality that is of again being identified with him. Now, the word know and you some of you may be saying, well, ah man, this is deep stuff. <laughs> Uh, could you just take a break for a moment? Let me breathe. This is, we're going down deep, staying down long here. We're, we're doing some deep sea diving here. And you may be saying, I don't understand all this. That's okay. That's what pa- Paul says, that's okay. Because in this passage, the word no is the lowest level of knowledge. Gnoskoa, gnosis. It's an acquaintance. It's underst- just a basic understanding. And Paul is saying, look. Just understand the basic. That's all, that's all you need to know. You see, spiritual exhortation is always built upon spiritual knowledge. We have to know. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we must remember our identity. A quote I gave last week was by John Stott, one of them. I gave several. And he said this about Romans 6. The necessity of remembering who you are is the way that Paul brings his high theology down to the level of practical everyday experience. Remembering who you are. I am transformed. I have a new life, a new heart, and I have died to that old sin nature. Are you following Look at verse 6. Let's read on. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin, that our body of sin, might be done away with so that we, here's a purpose clause, so that we would no longer be slaves to the sin, the old sin nature. Now, how do we know that Paul is speaking of the sin nature in this passage well, there's several reasons, several hints here. First, obviously, the definite article, that, that's, a give, uh, that's a given. But also, he uses the phrase body of sin, our body of sin. And in chapter 7, he's going to re- refer to that, that sin nature, and he say, there dwelleth in me th- no good thing, that is, in my flesh. But the word body, the phrase was a metaphor, body of sin. Why? Because... In the Roman dungeons, 
jails, we would call them, but their jails weren't behind bars. They were, they were dungeons. And in the Roman dungeon, if you were thrown, put in captivity, you would be chained to another prisoner. And it would not be uncommon for you to be chained to someone who is about dead or is either dead. And you would have to pull that dead body or that frail body around with you. And so Paul refers to that old nature like this dead body chained to you. But he says, you no longer are chained to that. I love that song that says, all chains are broken. Living hope. They're broken. No longer do we drag this old body around. Now, is he still present? Yes. But no longer does he have dominion and domination over me. So here's the second thing. Christ's death brought death to sin's domination. Could use the word dominion, but I prefer domination. Christ's death brought death to sin's domination. Miles Stanford is arguably one of the greatest writers when it comes to the Christian life. And Debbie shared a book with me back when I was in college when we were dating entitled Green Letters. It later became the book The Principles of Spiritual Growth. And he made a couple of, he may have made a lot of statements, but let me read what he said. We shall never know the experience of Christ's victory. I'm going to read this slow so you really get this. We shall never know the experience of Christ's victory in our lives until we are prepared to count, to reckon upon his victory at the cross as the secret of our personal victory today. There's no victory for us which is not first his. What, now watch this. What we are to experience, he purchased. And what he purchased, we ought to experience. The beginning of life of holiness is a faith in the crucified Savior. Who, now watch this. It's a great statement. Which sees more than his substitutionary work. It is faith which sees myself identify with Christ in his death and resurrection. You see? What's he saying? He's saying that just as Christ died for our sins, we in him died to the power of that sin nature in us. But we must live by faith. Stanford was saying that we must believe that. We must live by faith. We can't do that in ourselves, but in Christ, we, listen to this, not only did Christ defeat sin, Follow me here. We in Christ defeated sin. It's there in the text. Imagine you're a five or six year old child. You're at a water park in Marietta and you see this giant slide and you're too small to go over. You're not tall enough and you're also too fearful. But you want to go nonetheless. You've been there before as a kid, right? You can't go down this giant slide. You're disqualified. You're not tall enough. You're not. But mom or dad will say to you, come get in my lap. And you get in his, his or her lap, and you go down the slide, and you win the slide, right? You conquer the slide. The five-year-old, he said, will turn to, when he gets back, on the deck, he'll say to people, I went down that slide. Did he really go down that slide? Well, yeah, he did. But what enabled him to do that? Christ went down the slide of sin and death, of, of the world's sin and death. And he took us in his lap, and he defeated it. And in defeating it, we too defeated it as well. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 6, when he says Christ, the old self has been crucified, he doesn't say it's been eradicated, but he says it's been defeated. Is it still there? Yes, it's still there. Church, let me, let me share something that is incredibly important. In Christianity, the cross is the main thing. What Jesus satisfied and gained at the cross is the main thing. Without it, there's no power, there's no freedom, there's no forgiveness, there's no authority, there's no, there's no strength, there's no victory. 
The cross equals victory. And the cross is not just about your salvation, though it is vitally important. And we have that. But it also assures your victory every day. Hmm. So we need to understand our new identity in Christ. Not only as it relates to how God sees us, but also as it relates to how we relate to the sin nature. Now let's go on to verse 11. In verse 11, he says, Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God. Now let the word consider is a word that's translated in some translations, reckon. The old King James, I think, has the word reckon. You have the word reckon, it means to consider, reckon. It, it, it's, it's more than consider, it's more than reckoning, okay? It's a word, legizomai. It's a word which means to count it, to be so. It's an accounting term. It was a commercial or an accounting term meaning to impute, to impute or to charge to one's account. It's one thing to know, it's another thing to reckon. Many people have a general knowledge of the truths found in this chapter, but they never enter into the reality of these truths because they fail to count it to be true. Hmm. Let me read, uh, at the risk of reading too much, let me read Miles Stanford one more time. Through the crucifixion of the old man with Christ, the believer has been made dead into sin. He has been completely freed from sin's power. He has been taken beyond sin's grip. The claim of sin upon him has been nullified. This is the flawless flawless provision of God's grace. But uh, But this accomplished fact can only become an actual reality in the believer's experience as faith, and watch this, lays hold upon it and enables him moment by moment, day by day, though temptation assail him, to reckon it true. As he reckons, the Holy Spirit makes it, makes it real, real. He, Stanford says, makes it real. Uh, and he continues to rec- and as he continues, the Holy Spirit continues to make it real. Suppose you're a businessman. And you say to your accountant, how much money do we have in the bank to, pay, to cover our payroll for the month? Or how much is our payroll, you might ask. Well, he says our payroll is $20,000, but we only have 5000 in the bank to cover the payroll. He's, you say to your accountant, write the checks, but don't give them to the employees yet. You call the bank, you make arrangements with the bank, uh, banker for a short-term loan, $30,000. You only need twenty, but you make arrangement for 30000 You call back, your accountant, and you say to him, we're we're covered, we're fine, let the checks go. So the first employee comes in to you, or comes into your accountant, I should say, ready for his check, but your accountant says, I'm sorry, I can't give you a check. We only have 5,000 in the bank. And what's wrong with that picture? Number one, the accountant didn't have enough faith in you, right? And number two, he exercised an authority that he doesn't have, right? When we say that we are defeated, and we say, I'm just a loser, I never get it together, we're demonstrating no faith in our Savior. And we're exercising an authority that is not ours. Amen? Amen. Hmm. Here it is. For a Christian to live out the fullness of his new life in Christ, he must know and he must believe that he's not what he used to be. Do you believe that about yourself? Are you continuing to grow in Christ or have you kind of given up? Are you... Continuing to win the day, though some days you lose, you continue to battle. It may be three days forward and four days backwards. But are you winning the day? Christian must understand, despite his present conflict with sin, 
that he is identified with Christ and his victory on the cross. One of the responsibilities that I have as a pastor every wedding, as a couple will come down and the father will bring usher the, the bride down and the groomsmen will be there. And, and I, after an introduction, I'll say, who gives this woman to this man? And usually the father says, her mother and I. Now, at that point, we're done with the father. He's irrelevant at that point. He goes and sits down. We don't ask him his thoughts. We don't ask for his decisions or anything else. We're done with him. If he has something to say at the, there, I would say, be quiet. You're done. We're done with you. I probably wouldn't say that, but why? Because she now has a new leader. She has a new identity. She has a new relationship. She has a new authority. Jim and Ruth were two members of our church in Riverside, California. And Jim and Ruth had two daughters. I married both of them, officiated their service. After, during the first year, though, one of their daughters, the first one, I think, had had a spat with her husband, and she went home. And Jim and Ruth sat down with her, counseled her, heard her out, and told her some things that she needed to do. But then Jim said, now, you can't stay here tonight. You have a new home. You have a new husband. You have to go back. We are so identified with Christ that when the sin nature is tempted, tempting us, we need to say, you don't live here. You don't, you don't rule me anymore. You're not in charge of my life. You may have been before I trusted Christ, but you're not in charge of my life now because I've been set free. I have a new Lord. The last thing we see in verses 9 and 10 says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Now watch this. Death no longer is master over him. Hmm. For the death he died, he died to sin once. You get what he's saying? One last thing we get here. Christ's death on the cross brought death to death. I can't tell you how, how strongly I believe that and what it, what it means to me personally, having seen so many people, including my own parents, pass away. And to be able to stand at the graveside and to say, death has no victory. Its sting is gone. And one day this body is going to come out of this grave, but this body before then is alive and living today. Write down 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. That is enough. In fact, Paul talks about often that understanding that truth is enough to cause us to live differently, to live with joy and great anticipation. Now, what are the applications? Here it is. We must become active participants in this new life. You have the potential for a new life, transformed life. You have the potential for victory, and win, uh, the potential to see Christ work in your life every day. You may not win every day, but you have the potential to win every day. Number two, we must believe and stand on the truth. We've got to believe this stuff. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about that which proves that this stuff is true. Number three, we must discard our old manner of thinking. 